the bug that I have been struggling with for quite a while, a bug that actually took me quite a bit to read. Hello, fellow plot questers, it is I, Aaron the Plot Quester, and welcome to another plot questing video. And today we are here with the book Justice by Michael J. Sandal, and well, let's get right on to it. To give you guys a brief idea of what the book is, this book isn't really what Justice as Sandal thinks it is. It is a combination of different styles and different philosophies of justice. And Sandal puts together a lot of different justices or justifying of justice as well ironically put. For example, the philosophers that will appear will be there's quite quite a bit actually. There's Kant, there's Rawls, there's Aristotle, and of course Sandal has his usual commentary over the entire thing, however I'm just saying that a lot of the philosophy here, it's like a re-evaluation of what justice was thought to be over history. And so basically it gives you pretty much three main approaches to justice. One is maximizing utility or welfare. Number two is respecting the freedom of choice, which has two sub-branches, which is the libertarian view, actual choices made in the free market, and the liberal egalitarian view. By the way, this is my notes, I have a lot of stuff written down here. And, and it just talks about hypothetical choices, which I will talk about later. And third is cultivating virtue and reasoning about the common good. Let's get right into it. First off, maximizing utility or welfare. This is also known as utilitarianism, I believe. Utilitarianism. Oh wow, okay. And it is pretty much one of the main philosophies that, uh, that appears in this book. And basically it says that justice is maximizing the happiness of one person. Humans are born to don't dislike pain and like pleasure. So whichever choice that derives and makes the most pleasure in the situation is the right or just choice, or that is the philosophy. And so I so quick warning, spoilers for an anime series called Fire Force here. So in the anime Fire Force, there's this machine called the Amaterasu. And it's a huge generator that is actually being powered by one person with the adult outburst and this one person obviously didn't want to go in a machine and spend his or her entire life within the machine obviously not no the person was tricked and now the person is trapped within the machine of course the person suffering and letting out huge amounts of energy to enough to power the entire tokyo the entire city of course it saves millions and millions of people from dying to fire monsters and it it keeps the city safe but this one person must suffer in order for the happiness of many many people to be maximized can we really say that's just i mean the person's obviously suffering is it really just that one person suffers and everyone else gets to gets to just relax and chill is that is that really what justice is in my opinion that really isn't because obviously this one person is getting an unjust treatment for everyone else to be happy and that word unjust just right there makes it so that utilitarian utilitarianism completely flawed and i completely disagree with it and so does sample moving on Respecting the freedom of choice, we own ourselves, which is called which is called the libertarianism. Now I know I've been butchering every single nism. Let's move on. So people should not do anything if they don't want to do it. That is called respecting the freedom of choice. So we own ourselves, therefore anything that we do should derive from choice. The government should not be able to say, okay, we need money to build a road, therefore we'll tax you guys. That's not a thing. Nope. True justice, or it is believed within this particular type of thinking, is that it's basically whatever I want, I do whatever I want to do within the laws of ethics, and I'm happy, right? So if I do something that I want, we're happy, we're free, and it's just. Or so it says. 
However, sometimes, let's think about general stupidity. So the masses are easily swayed by one really smart person, for example, Hitler. His, his speeches were so inspiring that the masses were completely driven to madness, burning bugs, being Nazis, hating Jews, etc, etc. So that really makes it, that really just gives an idea of how this particular thing, the freedom of choice, well, is it really free? Because if someone manipulates you to support them, and you did make the choice, but is it really a free choice? And if the general is swayed and, and stupid, and they make wrong choices, and that affects the general happiness and quality of life, is that really justice? Or is that just really stupid and easily misused society? I would say the latter. So basically, okay, the, the theory of it, we do whatever we want, is, is nice, it's pretty. However, we gotta realize that pretty things in philosophy are usually not very realistic or can easily be misused in another way. So that's my opinion on that one. Then this time, part two of respecting the freedom of choice, the hypothetical agreement. This is called the liberal egalitarian view. So basically, basically it talks about how in a hypothetical contract, so a social contract is where two parties agree with each other, they put on terms and they sign, and then it's just, or so we think. However, obviously sometimes the social position matters and all sorts of annoying stuff matters. John Rawls believed that this was the perfect thing. So the perfect hypothetical contract in the perfect situation, in a hypothetical situation, in a contract, both parties do not know each other's weaknesses or, and neither does both parties have a moral or intellectual advantage over each other. Perfectly equal grounds, perfect IQ. They're both the same, same level of smart, same level of talking, same level of speech. So it's a perfect equal exchange contract. And that is basically what John Rawls saw. And basically, an, irreal, an, an, an irrealized example of this could be orchestra editions. So sometimes when violinists or any sort of musician, honestly, applies for an orchestra, auditions for an orchestra, they are behind a curtain, so the judges will not be able to see what they look like, what, what kind of manners they have. No, all they are listening to is the music, which is truly just. So. Yeah, that, that sort of thing is possible in real life. However, the perfect hypothetical contract. Is that really possible for two people not to know anything about each other and just make a contract? I don't think that's possible in real life. I mean, they need to have a certain amount of trust between the two people, right? Because in order for contracts to be made, we need to make sure that both parties are at least on decent grounds. So maybe a solution for that for that problem will be having a third party. However, we need to be able we need to be able to know that this third party is completely uncorruptible. And in this and, and in this world, that's not possible. So again, it is a pretty little thing. However, we gotta admit that in real life, in in this actual world, it's probably not the greatest thing in the world. Next, the infamous Immanuel Kant, the ontological ethics, the motive, not the action. Let's say you help someone on the street. Um, there's an old lady and she was, she had this really, really heavy bag, yeah? And you go to her and you help her out, but you're not helping her to help her out. You saw, you saw a classmate that you had a crush on in the street and you wanted to impress that girl to think that you're like a good guy, a gentleman or something. And that's what the real reason for for the carrying of the bag is. Of course, you have done something good. Helping an old lady on the street, it's obviously a good thing. However, the motive is to simply impress a girl. Is that really just? Is that is that really good? You're not doing it by the good of your heart. You, you're, just, you're just moving in your own selfish intent. And Kant says, then motive matters the most. If your motive is truly good, if you just want to help people, then that's good. But if you if you have alternative motives in order to do something, then that's not justice, that's not good. Or so Immanuel Kant thought. And Kant has a lot of like really hard to understand and sort of 
controversial at the time sort of things. Like for example, sexual intercourse. He believed that people didn't really own themselves. They, they have to give a sort of Kantian respect to each other. There's respect for what they are instead of a respect for the sexual desires. So they need to respect each other as a person. And if they're having just casual sexual intercourse, that's not right, or so it can't stop. So Kant is this really interesting philosopher and probably one of my favorites from more than this book, Motive, not the action, and also like Kantian respect, which is the respect of what the person is, not, not something within the person. So you respect the person for being a person, not for being like a cool guy or something, is what Kant is saying. And that's, that's interesting. And honestly, that's like the only one that kind of sort of makes sense in this book. I mean, everything makes sense in their own right, but that's the most realistic. However, you gotta admit, humans have desires and we, we work on those desires. We work on those ambitions. We work, we work for ambitions. We work for emotions. We work for very observed various things and we need a motive. And that sort of motive can't always be just the good of my heart for, for you to work and for you to be really, really hard driven. You need you need a strong motive, an emotional one, or a passionate one, not just, eh, I, I want to contribute to society, so I'm just gonna work. No, that that just doesn't seem right. And I think that Kant is right, that we do need to have a mutual respect for each other, for the person. However, then we should also have an opinion of what sort of person the person actually is. And an interesting example where a Kantian philosophy, it comes comes in, uh, comes Kantian ide ideology comes in, is for example, there's a murderer, right? He wants to look for your friend and he wants to kill him. Your, your friend is up in the cellar and the murderer comes up to you and you say, oh, have you seen this guy? And he's holding a gun, so you know he's a murderer. But, so, what would you do in that situation? If you say, oh, my friend, oh, I haven't seen him in 20 years. If you say that, that, in Kant's mind, is wrong, because you are not giving enough respect for the person itself. However, however, well, of course, Aristotle, I mean, Kant, yeah, so, but Kant, in that situation, maybe if he said, oh, oh I saw him um, a day ago, he came over to my house, you're not gonna say that he left, but you're gonna say that you did see him yesterday at your house, even though he is still in your house. That's misleading, but that's not a lie. So Kant is this really tech, this this guy who really focus on, focuses on technicalities, and I think it's really interesting. And he's an interesting guy, however, I think it strays a bit from the topic at hand, which is justice. So let's move on to one of the most famous philosophers of all time, Aristotle. Aristotle's view of justice was that you get what you deserve. You're born dumb, you go do physical labor. You're born with a special, special genius intellectual talent, go work for NASA. You get what you deserve, that is justice. Or so, so he thought. And, and if you can't really do anything, you can go be a slave. That was Aristotle's philosophy. And honestly, like on one hand, okay, people with talents, obviously deserves to go to good places. However, how about people who work hard? How about people who have effort? How about people who are born dumb? If, if, if people don't have the intellectual talents from when they were born, they're, they're just a normal guy. Then you send them to a good school or something like that, and then they'll become smarter and smarter until they can start passing words with the geniuses around, with the prodigy. Isaac Newton said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And like effort matters as well, Aristotle. I mean, you're talking like, okay, you, you were born that way, therefore you, you get what you deserve. That's all he's saying. Like, I don't think that makes sense. I mean, intellectually and physically, it just doesn't make sense. And I, I don't think that's really just a justified thing. So I, I really don't think that works. And finally, Sandal. Everything for the common good. So obviously, since everyone's ideas of justice is very, very different, and it depends on perspective. So what Sandal's saying is that, okay, so we need to just discuss about it, and we need to reason, and we need to justify, we need to debate, 
and we will find this closest thing that we can get to justice. And that is what we can do in the modern society. So that's, that's, that's a pretty, pretty little thing right there. However, my, I sort of disagree. I mean, okay, so what happens to the people who lose in the debate of reasoning? I mean, obviously they have their own honest opinion and obviously not everything can be implemented. However, is that really justice ignoring a minority of people that lose in the reasoning part of things and then just follow whatever sounds good and, and reasons good? Does that really make sense? Is that really justice? I mean, the people who are losing this debate, they all have the right to speak, they have the right to make changes, but they're oppressed. Why? Because they can't reason properly, whatever the lab means. And reasoning means to go through the different ideas and opinions and outweigh the good and the bad and all that. What is the good and the bad? What is the... What's the... What's the level of that? How do we determine that? That depends on perspective. And different perspectives means there's gonna be injustice. How is... How is this theory... How is this... This entire book, we've been talking about different types of justice. And more or less convinced me that... Justice is very perspective based and at the end you're like, okay, we need to we just need to talk things out If we could do that, we would have done that 20 million years ago There's obviously gonna be arguments. I mean, I know Sandal meant that okay. There, there really is no real justice. We need, to, we need to Relax we need to talk things out because there really is no real justice But even so I don't think the reasoning just that that, that just that's not right I mean, think about a war between angels and demons, for example. The demons are made. They, their desire, their instinct is to do what they want to do, to make humans suffer. Angels are, angels are doing their honorific duty to protect the world. One side's justice is another side's injustice. So if we look at it that way, then we sort of feel sorry for the demons as well. There's no good or bad in that situation. There is no good or bad in war. War only works if one side truly believes they are the good. And... It just, there is no justice in that situation. They're both fighting for what they want and what they desire and what they have to do. Is there really justice in that? No, there isn't. There's no true one and all justice. There really isn't. And the world isn't just either. So all in all, in conclusion, justice is a great book and you should read it if you want to know about different philosophers, and it's like it's like a doorway, especially since this is like one of my one of my first philosophical books that I've ever read. I just sort of went through it, and it was interesting. It was fun, although it was sometimes hard to read because sometimes the ideas sort of messed with my brain and melted it. But anyways, it's just reading it was really really fun, and it just opened a door to different philosophers and cool people and interesting ideas. And at the same time, I don't really think Sandal, I mean, he's been going for there is no real justice for the entire book, and at the end, he's like, oh, we can reason it out. Mm. I mean, I guess he meant, as a, as aforementioned, I guess he just meant, oh, we, we, but there is no real justice, so we, all we can do is talk about it, and that's the closest we can get. Well, that's true. And in conclusion, I honestly believe there is no real justice in this world. Where do you think you are? Heaven? You're on Earth, kiddo. Wake up. And every single aspect of justice have different pros and cons that don't really outweigh each other. Even though some are just dumb stupid, they just they just don't outweigh each other. You can't really you can say what makes the most sense in modern society or what sounds the most ethically correct or that. But what's closest to real justice? Perspective again. So, in conclusion, there is no real justice, and Sandal shows different types of justice and brings for an interesting read. So, I must read, like always, your plot quester, Aaron the book Aaron the... <laughs> Guys, expect an anime analysis in, let's say, a week. So, see you then, and have a great day.